Okay, I think we'll uh, get started, as, and we'll just let whoever trickles in, trickle in. Uh, so good evening. Welcome to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and to the second of our four McKnight Visual Artists discussions that are taking place in this month of April. My name is Michaela Korn. In addition to being a second year MFA student, I am a graduate assistant for the MCAD Gallery, and I helped facilitate many aspects of the McKnight Visual Arts Fellowship over the past two years. Carrie Morgan, the gallery director and the program director for the McKnight Visual Artist Fellowships, wanted to be here this evening, but a death in the family has called her away. In her absence, I have the distinct honor of briefly introducing you to tonight's discussants. First, our esteemed moderator is Claire Gilman. Since 2010, Claire has been a curator at the Drawing Center in New York City. She graduated from Carleton College with a degree in art history and went on to get her PhD in art history from Columbia University. Claire has taught art, art history and critical theory at Columbia University, the Center for Curio Curatorial Studies, Bard College, the Corcoran College for Art and Design, and MoMA. She has also written extensively for publications including Art Journal, CAA Reviews, Documents, Freeze, and October. Claire first visited our, our eight 2015 fellows in May of last year. Our fellows asked her back and she indicated a particular interest in facilitating a discussion with Kelly O'Brien and Scott Nedrillo. Kelly O'Brien is a sculptor originally from Buffalo, New York. Her recent, or, excuse me, she received her BFA at Buffalo State College and her MFA at Georgia State University in Atlanta. She currently is an assistant professor of sculpture at the University of Wisconsin-Stout, as well as being an acting uh, MFA mentor at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Kelly's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and recently has been featured in New American Paintings, commissioned for a site-specific installation for the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, and was a nominee for the Joan Mitchell Emerging Artist Award. Scott Nedrillo received his BA from Gustavus Adolphus College, St. Peter, Minnesota, and his MFA from the School of, Visual, School of Art Institute of Chicago. Excuse me. His post-photographic practice is involved with the technologies and materials of contemporary digital imaging, specifically the depiction of and our relationship to light. Recent exhibitions include the Walker Art Center, Housley McKay, New York, Kate Werbel Gallery, New York, Kansas, New York, the Soap Factory, Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, the Chicago Artist Coalition, and David Peterson, the Gallery in Minneapolis. The format of tonight's discussion includes short presentations by Claire, Kelly, and Scott, followed by a roundtable discussion between the three of them. Finally, Claire will open up, the question, open up the question and answer session to the audience, so you too will have the opportunity to get, engage with our presenters. Finally, I want to thank the McKnight Foundation for making this evening's discussion and all aspects of these fellowships possible. Since 1982, the McKnight Foundation has been supporting the work of mid-career art Minnesotan art artists and ten different in 10 different disciplines. In the visual arts alone, the foundation has provided over 300 artists the financial means and professional support to do what they do best. A special thank you to Arlita Little, the arts program officer and director of the Artist Fellowships. She, along with the program assistant, Kristen Marks, ensures that these programs continue to thrive. Hopefully, you will be able to join us here at MCAD for the next discussion that will feature Michael Rooks in conversation with Tracy Crum and Alexandros Lindsay next week. But now, I happily turn over this microphone to Claire Gilman. Thank you. Hello, thank you all for being here. Um, I am thrilled to be here tonight with Kelly O'Brien and Scott Nedrillo, two current McKnight Fellowship recipients. And um, as Michaela mentioned, um, as part of these series, the visiting critics are asked to select two artists to speak with um, around some kind of identifiable shared goal or shared, shared set of issues. So I selected Skelly, um, Skelly, Scott and Kelly um, because of the way in which their work engages with uh, multidisciplinarity, or more specifically, the way in which they use one or multiple media to reflect on another or different media. Um, so in Kelly's work, you'll see multi-part installations featuring paintings and sculptural elements where spandex simulates paint and paint simulates sculpture. Um, and in Scott's work, 
you'd see TV monitors simulating paintings or inkjet prints, uh, simulating photographic paper, um, simulating the TV screen, and so on. I mean, they will, they will explain how these dynamics function obviously much better than I can. But I chose this as a point of discussion because it is an issue with which I am um, continually concerned at the drawing center. So I just want to make a count of time here because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, so where I have been senior curator for nearly seven years. And uh, the Drawing Center is a me medium-specific institution, um, but what exactly the medium of drawing is, is not so easy to define. Um, and we are certainly not an institution that concerns ourselves purely and simply with works on paper or that defines drawing as being works on paper. Um, rather, we stage exhibitions that force us to think through what a drawing is and can be, and often that leads us to think about drawing through the lens of other media. Um, so I'm going to speak briefly about how these questions and concerns impact uh, my work at the Drawing Center. As Mikhail said, then uh, Scott and Kelly will each speak about their own work, and then we'll sort of open up the conversation to this to this issue generally, I think, um, but also in relationship to their work. So I'm going to walk you through just a couple of shows um, that I have curated at the Drawing Center uh, that specifically highlight this issue. But first, I'm just going to show you a series of slides um, of images that we have shown at the Drawing Center that might not one might not think of as being uh, suitable for an institution called the Drawing Center. Um, so this is a sculptural, you know, te technically, I guess you might call it a sculptural relief by Gago. Um, I'm not really going to give you the, the the caption details here, but I'm happy to later if you want them. Um, here's a piece with mag made with magazine wire newspaper um, by John Kessler. Um, this is a poured paint installation by William Anastasi. Um, this is actually a printing plate, and we did a show where we showed a series of printing plates as drawings. So we showed the actual printing plates, not you know, not not the prints that result from them. Thinking about that as a kind of drawing. Um, this is Pir Piranesi printing plate. Um, and then this is a piece by Rashid Johnson, a recent show that I did from 2015, which is black soap and wax on uh, tile, on white tile. Um, and this is from my last show that just closed, which is an installation um, by a Colombian artist named uh, Mateo Lopez. And most of those objects are made out of paper. The apple is actually made out of paper. The sculpture in the front is made out of paper. But this entire um, ensemble, he did have also drawings on paper in the show, but he thinks about it as drawing. Um, so. Um, I would say, while well, many of the shows that we have drawn at the Drawing Center have garnered, you know, critical praise, many have also had their fair share of negative or skeptical press. Um, for you know, for people that um, you know don't necessarily like this idea, I guess, of pushing the boundaries of drawing, and I think that all institutions are obviously scrutinized in this way. But I think because drawing is an intimate med such an intimate medium. Um, and one that connects with people in such a deep-rooted way, the public and critical reaction to drawing exhibitions can be particularly intense and emotional. And I think it is our job at the Drawing Center to sort of take these reactions into account, but also to you know, forge ahead with our mission and, and put together exhibitions that we think test and expand our understanding of what drawing is and can be. There have been four directors now since the Drawing Center was founded in 1977, each of whom have had a very different concept of what drawing is. Um, and so I'm going to focus on the one that has been developed between myself and our current director, Brett Lippman. And just to sort of clarify our position and uh, along some of these themes that I've been talking about, I wanted to show you how we've reworked our mission statement. Um, so this is our old mission statement, which I'm not even sure whether that was under Brett or before Brett came in. But it said, the Drawing Center is the only fine arts institution in the US to focus solely on the exhibition of drawings, both historical and contemporary. It was established in 1977 by curator Martha Beck to provide opportunities for emerging and under-recognized artists to demonstrate the significance and diversity of drawings throughout history and to sim stimulate public dialogue on issues of art and culture. And the new mission statement is, 
The Drawing Center, a museum in Manhattan's Soho district, explores the medium of drawing as primary, dynamic, and relevant to contemporary culture and the future of art and creative thought. Its activities, which are both multidisciplinary and broadly historical, include exhibitions, open sessions, a curated artist program encouraging community and collaboration, the Drawing Papers publication series, and education and public programs. So some key differences between the two that I want to highlight are that in the old mission statement, right, we use the term drawings with an S, which implies discrete objects and therefore I think would lead people to think of works on paper. Um, whereas the new mission statement uses the, draw, the term drawing, which suggests not um, an object but an action and which I think it has the implication that it could occur in multiple media. So that, um, you know, an object could be classified as painting in terms of how it's housed in a museum, but what's happening there might still be, still involve drawing. Um, and then I want to highlight that idea of the future of art and creative thought, which connects to our interest in the way in which drawing reaches across disciplines. Everyone draws, architects, filmmakers, um, even chefs. We did a show featuring the chef Ferran Adria, for instance, um, and we are, which I'm not going to talk about here, but which I do sometimes when I have more time. Um, and we are also interested in the way in which drawing interacts with other disciplines, um, even when it remains bound to the paper support. So when asked to define drawing, um, I like to say that I am not interested so much in what drawing is as in how it functions. So I don't really think that there is a singular definition of drawing, although I do think that there are, you know, traits which uh, maybe are typical of drawing and, and not other media. Maybe there are things that drawing is not, even though I wouldn't want to say that, wouldn't want to define it as being one thing. That's something we could maybe talk about in the open discussion. So I like to think about um, ways that drawing functions. So drawing can be a way of thinking. It can be an intermediary um, between self and world. It can be a way of mapping space. Um, these are just some of the ways of thinking about what drawing is and does. We can skip over that um, slide. Um, so now I'm going to just walk you through a couple of shows, um, three recent exhibitions that engage with these issues that I've been discussing. And I think I have, I'm already like well into the 10 minutes, so we'll, we'll, see, how, we'll see how this goes. But um, the first uh, show is called Drawn from Photography. Um, which was in 2010, and it was a group show uh, featuring 13 artists who make labor-intensive renderings after photographs, all of which have a sort of social political intention or resonance. And I came about this idea through observation. It was a trend that I perceived and that I really wanted to figure out. So sort of this idea of why do this? Why apply one technique to another in this way? Um, and basically, why engage in this rote act of copying? What is the purpose of taking a photograph and then trying to sort of render it legibly in drawn form? And I was really drawn to this. So the show was a way of my kind of working through that as well as trying to kind of give attention to something that I saw as being, that I was seeing kind of again and again. So um, just a few examples. Um, I thought I had another image in there, but. Maybe that I don't. Well, the piece there that you're looking at with the little colored images is a piece by Emily Prince, which are drawings of all the US servicemen and women who died in Afghanistan and Iraq from the start to the end of the war. Um, this is a project by Mary Temple, where she would date daily pictures of world leaders from the newspaper. Um, and then she would kind of write a little headline underneath the image, and she would place it high or low on the page, depending on her feelings of hopefulness about what the story signified. Um, this is images by Andrea Bowers of photographs of nonviolent protest training. Um, this is an image of the Paris 1968 riots by Frank Selby. Um, this is a series by uh, a British artist named Richard For Forster documenting a train ride that he would take passing by this steel refinery that he would take from his studio to his home. And then the drawings are taken. He would snap photographs at 12 second intervals and then the drawings, make drawings from that. Um, so I think that the most radical thing, oops, I went the wrong way. 
um, that the most radical thing about this show for me was that it suggested a kind of new definition of creativity. Um, that creativity does not require invention, right? But that seemingly this rote act of copying can be creative where it involves a sort of deeply felt response to the world. And I think for the drawn from photography artists, um, distanced as they were from the kind of activist gestures um, they depicted, this sort of simple act of paying attention through drawing um, became for them a political act. And Mary Temple said, you know, if I don't know what to do in this kind of chaotic world, um, the least I can do is pay attention. And she's sort of, in a way, showing her commitment through the tools of her trade, which is drawing. Um, and I think in this way, um, the show it had a substantial impact. I mean, it sort of opened up this desire for stillness amidst this kind of rapidly changing technological world that we are in. Um, but I think it also opened up new dimensions for drawing. It shows you know, how drawing expresses something or reveals its own potentiality in relationship to another medium, and that perhaps maybe we would never have thought about drawing in this way if we weren't thinking about it in relationship to photography and if we weren't pairing it with photography. So it's kind of in a way by putting it together with photography that drawing sort of comes into its own. Um, and then just quickly, uh, another group show that sort of that I did that sort of strove to tackle a, a similar kind of juxtaposition, I guess you could say, was a show called Drawing Time, Reading Time. And here I was exploring the relationship between drawing as a form of mark making and communication and language. And from the beginning, I wasn't interested in the kind of graphological relationship between drawing and writing. I wasn't concerned with the way in which drawing can be considered a form of language or writing comes to look like drawing. Um, rather, I was interested in artists who were themselves grappling with this relationship and exploring the way in which these two disciplines can and cannot or do and do not make meaning in the same way. So just one um, piece that I'll focus on um, that I think really crystallizes this, and it was at the, it was in the back wall of the show you can see here. Um, is this 451-page stream of consciousness novel um, by Sean Landers that he wrote on legal paper and installed on the wall. So he installs it like this, but it is also published as a novel. But when it's published as a novel, it's handwritten, right? It's not, I mean, it's not typeset. Um, so the book doesn't really have much of a plot. It kind of loosely follows this affair that Landers has. It's sort of half fiction, half reality. But he spends a lot, really the subject is Landers' own self-scrutiny of his life and position as an artist. So he says, you know, I want to be a writer, I want to be an artist, can I be both? And of course, the irony is that as he attempts to have it all, the fulfillment of one form negates the realization of the other. So when the novel is kind of spatialized on the wall and therefore apprehensible all at once, you can't read it, right? And when you read it, you don't, you can't see it all at once. So that tension between can it exist both as a visual object and as something that is readable and do those two forms of communication do the same thing? Um, I'm just gonna pass over these for sake of time. Just to show you the, the final show that I wanted to mention today, which I actually um, had at the same time as the Drawing Time Reading Time. So Drawing Time Reading Time was in our main gallery. And in our smaller gallery, um, I had this show called um, Dickinson Waltzer Pencil Sketches. Um, and they were actually, um, so it was sort of exploring a reverse dynamic. So whereas Drawing Time Reading Time was exploring works by visual artists that were involving writing, this show dealt with two writers um, whose work takes on visual form. So it focused on uh, these microscripts by the Swiss writer Robert Walser and um, Emily Dickinson, who unbeknownst to people until or very recently, wrote many of her poems on scraps of paper and envelopes. And my intention, so here you can see some of these, and my intention here was not to claim these works as drawings, but rather it was to encourage people to reconsider their status by putting these documents on view in an art institution. And specifically, I hope you guys have heard me because I realize I haven't been talking into the microphone, but and specifically one um, dedicated to drawing. So I made this clear in my wall text where I said, what is the status of these works? Are they texts? Not exclusively drawings, perhaps. 
Um, Dickinson Waltzer pencil sketches gives viewers the opportunity to decide for themselves. With extreme handwriting carefully adapted to the support at hand, stray marks and linguistic overlays, these objects are perhaps best described as visual works by two writers with all the uncertainty that such a phrase applies. And this was a very successful um, and beloved show by, you know, by museum goers. It was very well attended, but it also received a str strange criticism that I was not at all expecting from art critics who saw it sort of as trying too hard to kind of bend the definition of drawing, when really all I was doing was sort of using the opportunity of this institution dedicated to drawing to ask us to think through what it is. And I, I think that's what, in a way, all of us, Scott and Kelly, are also doing is like, you know, putting things, putting oppositions out there to ask us to think through what we think we know or don't know about certain media. So that is where I will end and turn things over to Kelly. So we're gonna You'll, you'll switch the PowerPoints, because I stopped. I didn't go through the whole PowerPoint. That's fine. <laughs> hey, can you hear me? Is that good? Great. Um, I am going to um, talk about my work to kind of give context to what Claire is talking about with emphasis on the intersection between multiple media within single works or installations. Uh, tonight I will be speaking with you about instances of what I refer to as clashing oppositions in my art practice, balancing between sculpture and painting. Um, first I would like to introduce myself. I'm Kelly. I received a BFA in sculpture and painting along with a BA in philosophy. Um, as stated before at Buffalo State College. Um, then I went to Atlanta for my MFA in sculpture. I am an assistant professor of sculpture and 3D design at UW-Stout and an MFA mentor here at MCAD. So materially, I teeter between painting and sculpture, often blending their traditional boundaries. I value both media equally in my practice I simply chose to focus on sculpture as opposed to painting during graduate school because I knew I would be supplied a larger studio space under that discipline. Uh, the conflict that sparked this interest in clashing oppositions was a realization during grad school. I was participating in a highly academic life during classes and studio time, but unwinding with, for lack of a better term, trash on television, specifically reality shows like Toddlers and Tiaras at the time. Um, I loved the debate and critique, supporting the aesthetic decisions with art history and building new things constantly, but I was fried when I went home every night and quite honestly wanted to shut my brain off to decompress after rigorous performance in the classroom all day. In a slightly therapeutic breakthrough, I admitted this double life to my teachers and peers and have made work examining the dichotomy between academia and decompression tendencies since. So my background in a nutshell is learning versus not uh, bled into sculpture or the real and physical versus painting the representative in art history, which is intellectual versus popular culture, recreational. Some heroes I discovered in grad school include Katerina Gross's painting installations and Angela de la Cruz's crushed painting sculptures. Both women manipulate paint as a sculptural material, and this was inspiring for me to see the categories blurred between traditional stereotypes. Here is a chart I made for you of these ideas of blurring boundaries in between materials and concepts. Academic or trusted values contrast guilty pleasures, and my area of interest lies in these vertical collisions, as well as the assumptions they conjure upon their binding crash. A visual example of this is a detail from a piece that clashes painting with sculpture, classical techniques with contemporary, the hierarchy of taste. This is the California sunset piece in its entirety. Within all its superficial imagery lies a personal tribute to the book Rebels in Paradise. As seen here, and you'll see Ed Ruscha is an inspiration of mine. When I received the McKnight, I was exploring a new series as an extension of these concepts. 
cats judge my abs abstractions in a disapproving way. The battle has begun, cats versus art. This had stemmed from a comment I'd overheard in an art museum around the time. And you've probably heard this as well. Is this art? My five-year-old could do that while looking at a Pollock or laughing while stomping on an Andre tile installation, cackling. I guess I have fine art in my house then. I find it amusing that if the, these individuals were more curious, they may be privileged to a glimpse of the philosophical rationale behind these highlights of abstract expressionism or minimalism. The cat as internet celebrity meme is agreed upon by the masses as an adored image, just as represent, representational oil portraiture is a trusted form of fine art. I have explored this theme of the intersection between multimedia, multiple media over several years in series of mixed media work. Sometimes the content took on reality, reality TV versus higher learning, sometimes internet memes versus art history, but the materials were always highly specific and deliberate. I use whatever material best associates with the idea I am trying to communicate. A consistent in the work is always the clashing oppositions thematically and materially. And sometimes just spatially. I have dabbled in the forced juxtaposition of interior and exterior art spaces. And of course, with the ever popular painting versus sculpture debate. The false boundaries that painting inherently implies are sloppily penetrated by the sculptural blobs. The simulation of what is real and what is not, the everyday and the ideal. When I break the edge of the physical area that a painting frame or container crops out, I ask the viewer to engage and conceptually participate while my work activates their space. Being pushed out of these invented comfort zones forces problem solving using the best material hierarchies for information organization. No image or material is chosen randomly. They are chosen carefully for meaning, functioning together to turn familiar materials into new conversations. And if these ideas are of interest to you, I recommend Provisional Painting by Raphael Rubinstein or Unmonumental, a sculpture exhibition that was at the New Museum in 2008. Um, I have moments of conceptual laziness where I simply make what I refer to as 3D paintings and let the compositions take over. But I am still under this umbrella of culture clashing self-portraiture concerns. I utilize stereotypes of the media's expected applications. Traditional landscapes are painted in oils. Airbrushing is for car culture, or let's admit, t-shirt lettering at your favorite mall kiosk. I use the airbrush for the California sunset, of course an homage to Rouché, as the text is painted in oils, swapping the vertical paint methods, the typical paint methods, excuse me. Expectations are exploited to force investigation. Unlike Rouché's poignant text paintings, I depict disposable or filler type language that unfortunately is overused in our mainstream popular culture. Painted words fill space in an urgent way, which contrasts sculptural qualities that fill space in an imperative way. In attempt for redemption, I generate perceptual nuances. Utilization of media follow suit, visually wrestling for the spotlight. Expectations of what is considered sculpture or painting are exaggerated for the compositional battle, and the form is dictated by the inherent nature of the material. These generalizations also branch into cultural associations, a material such as spandex serves, tawdry in its presentation, yet initially an expensive fabric. If the wearer assumes the brazen qualities assigned to the spandex, does my work as well? So speaking of generalizations, I generally believe that sculpture is more effective for me in creating empathy from a viewer due to its simple nature of existing in real space in real time versus the illusionary quality inherent to painting. I sculpt to show raw life moments and I paint to elaborate them. So I find value in discarded cultural trash. Our decompression tendencies expose our guilty pleasures. We choose to disengage and the distraction is a privilege. Through satirical humor, I hope to suggest a critique of our learned art world 
challenging obvious assumptions we routinely accept and enact. In my most current work, a sculpture manipulates the painting. I stretch, pull, sag, and let gravity's honesty help me depict portraiture through spandex as a wearable material, aided by rich tradition and forced through painting. At this point, you understand my material of choice is spandex, because spandex, unlike other fabrics, is tied to the body, mainly the female body, and is a brutally honest, unforgiving material. A conversation about portraiture happens quite naturally when using a material so specific to being worn as apparel versus curtains, upholstery, etc. The content is dealing with the universal conflicts I feel I have lost control over in day-to-day -day life, resulting in unflattering self-portraiture that depicts attitudes of post-news consumption or political reflection. Guilt, laziness, and disgust are overwhelming emotions of this new body of work, developing as a state of reflection in my studio daily. This new series is called Problems, dealing with things we perceive as problems, but ultimately are more accurately inconveniences. That's all I have for you for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, uh, so on this theme, or continued theme, of uh, how one medium can reflect on another um, and influence another, it's something that I thought a lot about um, through my own work. Um, but I wanted to start by showing um, a few photographs of, um, a few Ellsworth Kelly photographs. So this is um, from a show that recently uh, after he he died recently, um, and um, there was a show of his photographs, uh, and he never showed his photographs during his lifetime um, because they reflect the way that he was looking at things. Um, but he didn't use them as source material for his paintings. So you can see this um, the light in the shadow here, uh, and you can see this triangular shape. And you could imagine, or you could see this other shape, you could imagine one of these shapes could turn into an Ellsworth Kelly painting, uh, like a, one of his simple um, shape canvases. Um, like the, and the perspective on this shadow, um, uh, or this triangular shadow in this recessed space, um, uh, or this uh, screen that's in a trapezoidal shape. Um, and so, but there's a couple surprising things about the show for me because uh, the first thing was that um, to learn in a more kind of definitive way that he didn't, um, that he's not interested in using photographs as source material because it came from his sense of seeing and looking to drawing or collage to painting. And so if you put pho uh, photography in there, it's seeing, looking, photography, drawing, collage, painting. So you don't really need photography in there. Um, and he felt that the, the magic of photography, it just, it's just there. It, just, it can stay there. He just needs to take it out of there. Um, and then as a painter, and as someone who you know, was in Paris in the late 40s, because this is where you go if you're a serious artist from America at the time, um, the, his definition of photography as a peripheral thing to his practice, um, he said that photography is about seeing in three dimensions and trying to bring it into two dimensions in a way that recalls the third, and that this process takes place in the mind. Um, and so the, the key things for me here are that is about seeing, um, that's about seeing and looking. Um, and for Kelly, the sense of seeing and looking um, is very fleeting. And so it's like the difference when you, when you close one eye, open and close one eye, that things shift, or when you are when you move slightly and you see the rings of a chair um, shift a little bit, um, and so he was taking things as they appeared, 
and translated them from drawing directly into painting in this non-compositional way. But what he's taking from is very fleeting and ephemeral and has to do with, um, you know, uh, with this sense of seeing or looking. Um, and the other thing that is key to me here is that the way that he's using the word recall. And so he says, uh, you trying to bring it into two dimensions. Once you have something in two dimensions, how can something in two dimensions recall a third dimension? And so like this, this idea of how something can recall a third dimension um, seems very poetic to me in a way. Um, and it also, I think, is an evaluation of photography that is coming from somebody who is um, engaged with the practice of drawing and painting. Um, so um, after the show, I started, I, I thought a little bit more about some of my, um, my past work that exists in, in between mediums anyway. Um, these are columns of inkjet paper that are standing up and they come off a 60 inch roll and it's like the luster pa Epson luster, pa luster paper that you all know. Um, and it wants to curl when it comes off the roll. And so here it's curled in on itself and sanding these columns. And I've approached the paper in a simple way um, and I've taken the Epson ink and I put it into an airbrush. Um, and then I've, uh, I coat the, I spray the paper, I spray the front of the column. And when it gets unfurled, there's two columns of color and where the paper meets, there's two lines. Um, this is an image of one of the pieces that's called Afterlight. Um, and it's, it's difficult to see in photographs to a certain degree. They're very subtle. Um, but you can see that on the top part of it, there's two cyan columns. And on the bottom part, there's two pink columns. Um, and um, so I was interested in using the capacity of these, um, using the capacity of these materials uh, to represent something photographic. Um, uh, but um, but what, what is being represented photographically is just something blurry, essentially. It's like blurry columns, but it's also a picture of itself when it was an object, in a sense. It's the impression of the ink is there from when it's arranged as a column. So if you think about it as a picture of itself when it was an object, um, this reminds me of what Kelly was talking about with photography. Um, how you can take something that's two-dimensional and have it recall a third dimension. And in a way, um, it, this picture recalls these columns in this, uh, in this shape. Um, it's uh, you know, a very simple illustration <laughs> of what Kelly was talking about, except there's no camera or printer being used in the making of this. Um, and so they're called afterlight because they are afterlight in the sense that there's no light involved in making this piece that could be considered a photograph. Um, there's no uh, you know, light exposure or photochemical process. And it's after light because, I think in a painting sense, um, because um, it's about light or um, what it's um, depicting in these glowing kind of hazy columns, um, uh, the subject is light. Um, and then, uh, so this is um, at the Ordinary Picture Show um, at the Walker last year. And was, uh, the piece was in the section of the show that addressed the apparatus of photography. And so by using standardized materials, just the, the Epson paper and using the CMY colors, um, um, you know, it, but there's no camera or printer involved. It, it, becomes, the piece becomes about, you know, about photography um, and about this, this definition, Kelly's definition of photography. This is a newer piece um, that is based in the same process. You can see the, the paper is curled into a cone. Um, and here's two of them. 
um, as they are uh, uh, mounted and um, framed. Um, and you can see there's four bands of colors in each of them. You can see it more visibly in the bottom. And with these, I, um, I sprayed each side of the cone from four sides. And, th and I'm thinking with these pieces more about the relationship between photography and sculpture and how um, photography has been used to document sculpture since the history, since photography was invented, it's been a useful tool to, um, to make sculpture something portable and documentable and something very important for art history. Um, and so uh, these pieces um, are sprayed from four sides and then unrolled, and you can see the, um, you know, the, uh, the bands sort of radiate out, and those are the four sides that are being sprayed. Um, and you can see the distance of the white is different on each one. It just depends on how tightly the paper is curled. Um, and these are called polyfocal, or they're um, numbered polyfocal. Um, and so uh, those are the photo-based pieces that I want to talk about. Um, and then I have these Brancusi photos. Um, so these are Brancusi's own photos of his sculpture. Um, so I was thinking about the relationship between photography and sculpture. Um, and I also make video work. And so um, I wanted to, um, especially being around these columns of paper that look like sculptures, I wanted to figure out how can, um, you know, how can, how can I um, start making sculpture, essentially? And um, um, so this is, a, this is a video piece. It's called Viewfinder Sculpture. Um, and it's my, my answer to this uh, question of how you can combine essentially a movie um, and a sculpture in, into one piece and how to essentially literally turn a TV into a sculpture. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking about the TV here as essentially a light emanating plank, um, like a plank in a, um, like a McCracken kind of tradition. Um, and in the movie, there's light coming in to the space that you're seeing in the TV. Um, so and it plays in real time. And then Kelly mentioned um, she thinks about sculpture as existing in real time. And it's something that I, this is something I think about a lot as well. Because when you see this in the gallery, there's a relationship that starts forming between the light that is emanating from the TV and the light that's in the gallery. And I think about this relationship as essentially a movie within a movie. If you're thinking about a movie, the definition of a movie as um, changing light in a very simple way. Um, and you can see that the TV is is emanating light, is reflecting off of the, the print that's on the floor. It's pushing light into the, into the gallery. And I'm using direct light coming, uh, direct sunlight coming through a window um, precisely to make the TV emanate more light. Um, and so in this, in this piece, the, the light moves through the frame. And I was thinking about, um, just going back to this briefly, um, you can see that Brancusi is using direct light here um, to document his sculpture. And the sculpture he's documenting is quite reflective. So you think this is kind of a bad idea to you know, document this sculpture. You're not going to be able to really see it very clearly. You're not going to be able to see the edges of it very clearly. Um, and there's a, um, the story about him is that uh, at some point, someone was hired to document his sculpture. And they, he left the studio to let them take pictures. When he came back, they had put um, a coat of powder on this sculpture so it wasn't reflective, so they could take pictures of it. Um, and Branguzzi was like, what are you doing? Uh, no, one, no one's going to document my sculpture anymore. I'm going to take these pictures. Um, but his answer to documentation um, were pictures that sort of looked like these. I mean, not all of them look like this, but uh, and so I, this is like a question of like what, you know, what is Brancusi thinking if 
he's saying, he's thinking, this is the best way to represent my sculpture in a photographic way. Um, so again, I'm thinking about how a sculptor is thinking about photography or how they're using photography, um, especially when their, pri their primary medium is not photography. Um, and so the, the only thing I think of is essentially that Brancusi was thinking about um, repre representing this work um, to have a sense of time around it. And so you see the sunlight coming through. You see the sun is at different stages in each photograph. The photograph is capturing one moment, but, um, but I think that you would have, I think, the sense that the sculpture is going to look different when there's different light on it. The sculpture might look a lot different if it's, if it's placed outside and there's different light on it at different times. But also that um, this idea that um, sculpture exists in real time and that time is moving around the sculpture and that this sense of time for sculpture, especially if it's like made out of tough materials, can be quite long. And that um, in, to represent that sense of time in a photograph, one way to do this might be to show a moving sun on the sculpture. Because sun, the sun is essentially one of our oldest timekeeping devices. Um, uh, you know, sundials, but just with, obviously with the um, uh, day and night. Um, and so here I'm using the sun, you know, as a way to, um, to show the passage of time. Um, almost as a, as a sundial. This is a, um, a video that shows um, it shows um, the light moving in time elapsed, so the TV is on fast forward here. So you can get a sense of, um, of what happens when the light is moving through the, through the frame. Um, Um, oh, you know, uh, the other thing I heard recently in, in, uh, at a McCracken show in New York, uh, Matthew Higgs was, was recounting an interview he did with McCracken. <coughs> and McCracken had the story about how when he, after he graduated from high school, um, he got off the bus and he was sort of looking in the sky and wondering what he was going to do next and asking big questions. And he had this distinct feeling that someone was watching him from up in the clouds like from way off in the clouds. And he's sort of looking around and thinking like, who's watching me? Um, and this impression stayed with him for a while. And so he went, off, went on with his life. And then about 15 years later, he's sitting in his studio and he's thinking about things. And he, he was thinking about this time when uh, he was, had gotten off the bus and he thought someone was watching him. And then it hit him that um, 15 years later when he was thinking about this, uh, he was seeing himself from the point in the clouds that he thought someone was watching him. And so to McCracken, um, he, he realized that the person watching him was himself from the future. <laughs> um, and that the inner, the kind of inner, he talks about the inner reality of his mind like allowing for time travel. Um, and so and McCracken's a sculptor, a sculptor right? Um, so I'm thinking about, um, um, you know, I'm thinking about these pieces and how when you're looking through this viewfinder, you're seeing a space of sculptural documentation. You're seeing um, the way that this paper and the, um, the seamless paper behind it, you know, it's, it's set up on a sweep. Um, it's like a normal place where you, um, where you, document, um, where you document sculpture. Um, and I'm thinking about, but I'm thinking about these pieces as, um, you know, how they can more, how could, how they could operate like on a 24-hour loop, um, and how, uh, and how that sculpture would move through time. So, you know, ima if you imagined, um, let's say that the the window and the the structure are taken away from this frame, and um, and you're running this all day and all night. 
and the, the light and the shadows are changing like a sundial. Um, and you have this running on a 24-hour loop, and, it's a, and it represents one, one unit, one day of time. Um, but as time passes, uh, when you look through the viewfinder, you still see that one unit, that one day, the light of that day. Um, but the sunrise and sunset are always going to be relation, relational to that day in the space around it. Um, and so I'm thinking about time in video is usually, you're thinking about in, internal sense and time in video work has to do with the time code. It's, it's an internal time that's inside the video. Um, and if I'm thinking about time in video and I'm trying to make this movie into a sculpture, I'm thinking about external time. I'm thinking about how time moves around something. Um, and so, um, anyway, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to figure this out. Trying to figure this out. Um, but I thought that McCracken story was really funny about um, time travel, but I really think it, um, there's something interesting about it if you're trying to free the time code, essentially, um, of, uh, of these videos. Um, let's see here. And then I have one more slide of, let's see. And here's another example of a viewfinder um, sculpture piece that is in um, a different color. So for me, it's been um, you know, really useful to reflect on one medium as it relates to another, um, but also look at the work of artists um, who have experimented outside of their, prime, uh, their primary, primary medium in the past. Uh, thanks. So now we'll start the round table. Okay. We have some more light. You can turn the lights up a little. Can we get the lights here? Or do it? Okay, good. It's nice to have a little light over here. So, um, all right. So, what'd you say? Oh, should I use the microphone? Can you, all right. Can you not hear me? Okay. It comes off. Oh. Exciting. Okay, here we go. Uh, so let's see. So that was um, that was amazing. I mean, that was just great listening to both of you. That was fascinating. And I had had a sense of Kelly's talk a little bit before, but not as much yours. Um, so uh, I think just a, a lot of things are going in round in my head right now. But a couple of things that that you talked about towards the end that I thought might be useful to pick up on. So one thing. Um, the quote that you were mentioning from Kelly, you know, where he's talking about, which is such a beautiful quote, this idea of um, photography as being this attempt in two dimensions to recall something in third dimensions, and that that is sort of what your um, object, whatever you would call it, I don't know if you would call it uh, what you would call it, whether you call that afterlight piece a photograph or uh, I don't even, I don't know what you call it. What do you call it? Um, okay. um, well, I'll let you answer that, but here's my question, uh, what, what you call that. But then my question is, what, what was interesting was that that definition of photography um, really had nothing to do with materials. It was a purely conceptual definition of photography. And that you were then able to apply that definition to your object, which used completely different, which didn't use any photographic techniques as we technically understand them, but that it could become a photograph for you because conceptually it had the same, in a way, definition. And then I was thinking about Kelly's work also um, about how 
oftentimes your paintings and or your wall works and your sculptures will use the same materials. You know, you'll use spandex, they'll be painted, they'll have color. Um, and so, but yet you make a distinction between when you consider them to be paintings, when you consider them to be sculptures, and that that's not based on meat, it's not based on materials either, in a way. So I was interested in that idea of how do we define a medium, and can a medium be defined conceptually? So maybe I'll just um, ask yeah, you that I, first. I, um, uh, it's something I went back and forth on a lot, because uh, I think you can call it, you could call it a painting, or you could call it a photograph. Um, and um, it's a little bit ambiguous, and I'm presenting them in a way that um, leads to more ambiguity. So um, you can see it's framed without any plexi over it, and the fra it has this beveled frame it, um, that looks like a frame you would put on a painting. It, I saw a show of Joan Mitchell's paintings from the mid-60s, and the frame is exactly the, exactly the same, for example. Um, and I feel that there's a little bit, sometimes there's an advantage in presenting something with a little bit of amb ambiguity um, to allow the viewer to, to be a little more flat-footed. So they're flat-footed, they're, um, they're in a position, they don't really know what, they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know if it's a painting or a photograph. Um, and I think this is uh, a useful, this is a, a useful thing to be slightly confused because after you're confused, you either stay confused or maybe you figure something out. <laughs> um, and um, uh, as far as the material nature of it, 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 I mean, it doesn't, it does, I mean, strictly speaking, you could say, you know, um, this isn't a photograph. There's no, there's no negative. Um, there's no light that's, um, there's no light that hits, that has hit a sensor or a negative. Um, but it certainly involves the materials that we, in its output, that we currently define as being photographic. Um, like anything coming out of an inkjet printer could be considered a photograph mm -hmm. at the current time. Um, and so there's a little bit of a, <laughs> it's maybe like a suspension of disbelief a little mm -hmm. bit, um, where I can say that this is a photograph. It might be like slightly more radical to say this is a photograph <laughs> than to say this is a painting even. So um, in one sense, I've gravitated toward, um, you know, uh, calling them photographs because it might be more in more interesting, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, though, because I, I also wonder, you could make something that used that definition of photography, but that didn't use the materials of photography. You know, any kind of imprint, right, could, could be a recollection of something in three dimensions, but now it's in two dimensions. Um, but then would that be a photograph? I don't know. I mean, it's just, in, it yeah. just I, I, don't, it's not, I don't have an answer to this. It's just an interesting question yeah. about how we define something. Um, I don't know if you want to address. Sure. Your thoughts about it. Yeah, I think the, the distinction for me would be this idea of evidence and the, like the process of evidence. So even though sometimes like it might be confusing because I paint on the spandex and you know um, manipulate the materials in really similar ways with similar color palettes, it's about this idea of like um, the evidence of what has happened uh, in the technique. So for painting, it's um, you know the the idea of the representation or the illusion. So I sit and I paint like it's you know it's painting. So then for sculpture, it's everything else. It's like the real um, like physical things that I do. Like I. I sew, I build, I glue, I, you know, wrap things, um, and then you see that evidence. So, to me, that's the, the distinction. This, um, you know, what can the viewer figure out from the technical process? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it, it sounds like none of us would want to sort of get rid of the idea that there are things that we can think about as photography, or as painting, or as sculpture. And that there are things that we wouldn't want to call photography or sculpture, or though, even though those boundaries are very fluid. Um, it's the same thing, I think, with, as I was mentioning in my talk about drawing, that I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that anything is a drawing, but I also wouldn't want to say that one thing specifically is a drawing. So I'm, I'm wondering also if it is through this, this kind of collision of other media that we can kind of best answer that question. 
of, of what is and isn't, that we have to look through this lens. And then that brought me to this other thing, which I thought was very interesting, was that McCracken, um, you know, comment or whatever, that he had seen himself, that he had felt like he was being watched, and then he realized many years later that it was him watching himself, that that I almost feel, at least for me, and I don't know if this is something that you guys feel in your work, that often when you look at one media through another medium, you are gaining distance from that medium, and so you're sort of able to see it, see it as separate from the other thing, even if you don't know exactly what it is or something. So like in the drawing from photography, you know, it's, it's by using the photograph that you're able to see, okay, well, what am I doing here with drawing that that photograph isn't doing? And what is that photograph doing that this drawing isn't doing? So you're kind of defining it in its, in its separation from the other thing rather than saying what exactly it is and that you're, in, you're kind of acquiring some sort of distance from it in that process by looking at it through this other lens. Um, I don't know if you guys have comments about that. Um, I, I think about that distance as, um, as a narrative. So this, um, this kind of gap between either concepts or maybe materials, um, especially opposing materials, uh, creates a new conversation by putting something familiar with another familiar thing. So whether it's two objects or a painting and a sculpture together, it's, you know, that distance that's you know that space in between kind of to me creates this um, this new conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think about in terms of um, uh, in terms of image making, like on a spectrum kind of. So, the spectrum mm -hmm. of image making that I'm mm -hmm. interested in um, participating in mm -hmm. um, is on way, uh, way on one end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so if, and which, which, which end so it's that? like the Liz Deschens end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It's where you decide, I'm going to make a picture, and then the picture is two blurry columns. Um, it's not a picture, it's a picture of itself and it's an object, but it's really not a picture of anything in a normal sense. And you decide, I'm going to make a movie, um, you know, but I'm making a portal that is going to eventually look back in time. Um, and um, and on the spectrums of, you know, if you're thinking about something as a movie or thinking about something as a photograph or an image, um, uh, you know, you take it back to the first, the first simple decision, you're going to make, you're going to make a picture, you're going to make a picture of something. Mm -hmm. um, what is that going to be? Um, and I'm interested in taking it back to that first decision. Um, because you have on the spectrum, you, know, you have everything. You have um, you know, Resident Evil movie over here, and you have like Liz Deschens, like <laughs> she's over there, over there. Um, but there's, it's pretty, it's pretty wide, and I think this speaks a little bit to what you're talking about, where, where these, um, where these lines are, um, and and how permeable things are. But I kind of see it as, you know, um, um, you can you can question, you know, if this is even a photograph or not, but um, I think in one sense it does fall on the spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But and I think the other, I mean, the other thing is that if if we didn't have the other side of the spectrum, we wouldn't be able to work on this side of the spectrum. It's like this side of the spectrum requires the other side of the spectrum to function, right? I mean, we need that that sort of the standard, whatever that is, definition of something to sort of work against that. Um, which is sort of what you have been talking about, about your interest in kind of, you know, it's not like any of us want to get rid of that idea that, that there are these kind of standards. It's just how we define them. Um, you know, and I guess that's the question is, do specific materials have kind of inherent properties that are sort of inherent to them? Or can, can any material express anything? I don't know. I mean, it's such a... Yeah, I think that... Um I like to use stereotypes uh, to my advantage because they can be, of course, a hugely negative thing. But um, stereotypes, uh, as far as what categorizes painting or sculpture or um, the things that uh, are associated with materials like spandex, I can talk about the female form really quickly. Like I like to use those things because um, even even if the stereotype is negative, like um, 
you know, like I'm putting uh, painting in a category and sculpture, I, I like at least um, to make a stance and then the audience can then be mad at me and take a stance against me. So being the antagonist to me is still um, a successful move in my artwork because then I can still get my message out. Even if you don't like my message, at least you're standing strong on your angle of it. Um, so I like to exploit stereotypes for that purpose. Yeah, and I guess I wonder if, you know, are are these properties and are these stereotypes based in something that is kind of specific to the medium or are they based just in the way that the medium has been positioned throughout history? Because spandex is a very good example because spandex, you were saying, was initially a very expensive medium, but for whatever reason, it became associated with, you know, cheap... Um, and I guess the the, the form-fitting nature of it, but it was a, it didn't necessarily have to go that way. So I don't know. And you could ask the same questions about paintings. Are there, is there something inherent to, to it, or is it something that has just taken taken these th things on throughout history? I don't know. Um, I don't know if there are answers to that, or if either of you want to comment on that. Um, I mean, it's a big question. But then the other question, I guess, that comes out of that is, you know, for the viewers of your work, and I know we talked about this before a little bit too, like if a viewer is coming, if your work is depending on certain associations, certain art historical associations um, that you may have knowledge of, but let's say the viewer of your work doesn't have knowledge of those associations, doesn't necessarily associate painting with something specific or spandex with something, you know, how, how do you... How does that factor in? And is then the content lost, or does it just become something else? Yeah, um, I, I, I kind of like uh, when a viewer comes in and doesn't understand art history. Uh, to me, it, it's like a research tool, because then um, I, I can think about how my work functions in different layers. And I really want my work to function in different layers. So if it's in a gallery, um, I want it to grab somebody's attention quickly. And uh, I was talking about this earlier, like a magpie effect, like um, it's shiny. I'm gonna go over to that bright and shiny thing. And so that's the first layer that you don't need any art history. You just, you know, catches your eye. So I kind of utilize viewers instinct to do that. And then once I catch somebody there, almost like I've baited them there, um, then I can talk about uh, problems or issues that I like were driving the artwork in the first place because that's my seed is not m maybe making the mark but the conversation is uh what fuels you know my drive to make things in general so um you know not everybody's going to get to that point to have a conversation about um you know you know the the conceptual philosophies behind my work. They might just be like, "Wow, I love hot coral. It's such a great color." I mean, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay because, um, you know, people are talking about art, enjoying art in in different layers, and whatever's accessible to that person seems it seems like a positive to me. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Um, I agree. I I I agree with this. I think about. Um, um, I think about it in a similar way. Um, there's the, I mean, I guess conceptual underpinnings to something you're trying to do, um, but it's going to take, um, like how it does it and the form it takes, um, um, you know, the the content that's there. There's a lot of different, um, a lot of different elements uh, to a piece, and so, um, you know, uh, it it's something that. Uh, I think for something to be, for something to be successful, and what puts, what makes things a little bit better is, you know, if it's if it's just kind of firing on all of those levels. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can see it without any um, without any knowledge of the medium, um, without any knowledge of of art history, um, and it still does something, <laughs> it's still mm -hmm. going to it's still going to um, uh, something's going to happen. Um, but then, as you kind of cut the la uh, cut things down um, and get more into um, the minutia of things, um, uh, and that's where I'm, I'm interested 
you know, I'm interested in things, when I'm going to, when I'm going to look at things, you know, often there are small details that will push, it pushes something in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after you've seen all of the, all of the other stuff, right. and you whittle things down to these smaller decisions, like things often um, turn on these small decisions or small ways that materials or um, mm -hmm. or processes have been mm -hmm. um, undertaken. And so, um, you know, it's like a, a cone or something. You can start, you start big, a wedge, um, and you end up small, but it's, um, you know, uh, I don't know, if, I don't think it's really diminishing returns um, at the bottom of the wedge, um, because I think this is where, you know, things get good or not. Um, mm -hmm. So if people pay attention to your work enough, they'll start to find like prizes hidden. Well, I think that um, yeah, I mean attention um, is probably required to get to the bottom of the wedge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it could be you know a different kind. It could be a, it doesn't have to be a necessarily an act of attention. It um, if you encounter something, if you spend time with something, um, um, things sometimes just happen. Uh, Realizations happen, or yeah. you you uh, you will realize things without really thinking about it. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. So sometimes, so yeah. hopefully. I think that that also has something to do with the, the kind of in y these sort of unexpected things that happen when you use when you use when you kind of integrate media, even if people don't know much about her history. But like in the drawn photography show, when someone would come and look at something and think it was a photograph, and then realize it's a drawing. I think in that moment, something unexpected occurs. And then you think, well, why is, and that moment of unexpected grabs your attention and causes you to spend more attention and not to pass by the thing. And also then to ask yourself, well, why are they doing that? Which was the thing that I asked, what is the purpose of that? And either you find there's no purpose in it and, and you move on, I guess, but at least you've thought about it or, you, or some major ideas start to open up for you about what is the value of, of art making. Um, I guess since we have about uh, only a little bit less than 15 minutes, we should open up to questions from the audience. So if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand and then we'll bring you a microphone. Um, if anyone has questions. If they don't, we can continue talking up here, but I hope someone will ask, will have some question. Does anyone have any questions for, for any of us or around these issues in their own work? No question. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe the, maybe the woman back there with the glasses. Or Sure, microphone. I can yell. <laughs> um, both of you, I think, use um, a sense of presence of the body or the perceptions that the body inter interacts with the world through. And I'm wondering if either of you or all three of you can talk about how you perceive the relationship of the body or the senses in your work. Um, for for me, I just I just use it as a tool because um, I think that when there's sort of this uh, empathy, like this relation, like uh, this one to one um, between something you can um, you know you can almost like appreciate that this thing has gesture, that this thing is like you, so then you can. Um, you can feel whatever uh, you know issue that I'm trying to convey a little bit deeper because uh, you relate to it and you um, start to have this uh, maybe sympathy for the piece, which you know it's generally harder to get sympathy out of an object than it is another person. So when it sort of references a person, it's um, I think it's considered a little bit deeper. Just uh, it's just human nature to do that. Um, uh, I get to think about, um, uh, well, I think about my own relationship, uh, uh, to the, to the work, let's say it's, it, or any work, like it, whether I've made it or not, um, and I'm putting myself in front of it or I'm looking at it, um, uh, you, you can, re you, I can register what is happening, um, 
And I try to keep that the same if I'm looking at something that I'm looking at in my studio or if I'm looking at something somewhere else. So, um, and then from there, I, I can't predict what's going to happen. So, um, because I feel that, I mean, part of the strength of um, uh, looking at art is that people have different responses to it. Um, and so, um, so I, get, I can put myself in front of it and that's about all I can do, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's if it's really a question for me or not as a curator, but I mean, I guess I do I do think very much though about um, pre you know the presentation in terms of um, how how one is moving through that space. I, I do think about that very much for me. That's very important. Um, it's not just about the the art and you know getting and expressing something through the art and choosing the artworks on the basis of what how much I want to show from the you know I definitely think very much about what the narrative that's being told both conceptually and physically giving moments of rest giving moments of you know maybe concentration. Uh, I do, that is important to me as well as a curator and it's an enjoyable aspect of being a curator. It's, it's where I guess the sort of artistic component maybe of being a curator comes comes into things. Um, I know that you in the, had a question. Oh, sorry, one more thing. I, I also think that like that's a strength in, um, in sculpture in that instance when you're talking about moving through a space because I think it's really powerful to uh, be in this like physical um, you know, as space with this, with this thing that instead of this, uh, you know, representation. So I think that that's one of the reasons why I really love utilizing sculpture as well, just as this um, presence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. So this question might be more specifically for Scott, but I'm I'm kind of thinking about what your relationship is with the documentation of your work. Like you talked about freeing yourself from like time code, but essentially in making this presentation, you're kind of embedding time code within time code, and you have like movie within movie. And that makes me kind of start to think about even the, the printed work, where you, you specifically mentioned that you don't have plexi, that it's a relationship between the image and the viewer. And to me, this presentation kind of becomes like, you know, a metaphor for that plexi with that video. Um, so yeah, I guess I was wondering if you could maybe talk about the relationship that you have to the documentation of your work outside of like, the necessity of presenting it. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't know. If I, what, oh, good luck. Um, you know, uh, uh, well, I think documentation is actually, it can be a little frustrating, right? Because, and this is something that maybe goes back to these Brancusi photos, because he was trying to be creative about this. Um, and his results are not um, appropriate uh, documentation. <laughs> so, um, it you know, we for most of the things that we're using documentation for, we need uh, appropriate documentation. But it doesn't give you a very good sense of being there. It doesn't give you a very good sense of um, of, um, of of time and of being there. And it's something that I've heard um, before, the uh, like uh, documentation in general. Yeah, and it's something that I've heard before. Um, you know, uh, with the um, uh, these these show images, um, you know, people who have seen the images and then people who have been at the shows. Um, uh, I've heard this before where, um, you know, uh, perhaps you have to maybe slow down a little bit. Um, you have to uh, sit there a little bit um, that things maybe unfold over, over a little bit of time. Anyway, it's, it's difficult difficult issue, yeah. In terms of making a presentation in an auditorium like this that includes documentation that also is perhaps like a little bit more creative, <laughs> uh, uh, creative like, um, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, um, other than um, it probably would involve, uh, you know, something that would be antithetical to the idea of just trying to communicate what the work is about, because <laughs> you'd be 
you'd be you'd be starting down the path of trying to make another piece for the auditorium, kind of. But the interesting thing I was thinking about when I was looking at those Brancusi photographs is, um, you know, is he adding in those photographs? Is he adding something external to them through the use of the photograph? Or is he just revealing something that's kind of already there um, that maybe we just couldn't see without the photograph? I don't know, which is a question. So then is it document? Because if it's the latter, then it really is just documentation in a way. Uh, I mean, a kind of wonderful form of document. If it's the former, then it's, then it's not documentation. It's becoming, it's becoming an artwork. I, don't know. I think it's somewhere in between. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's somewhere, maybe it's somewhere in between, I'm, um, but I think that's a good, that's a, um, um, that's a good distinction though, yeah. Um, because you were saying, I mean, in a way, and this goes back to what you're saying, that sculpture, you know, you are, in sculpture, you are, there is a temporality. You do walk around it, and, and in a way, what he's revealing in the photographs is that aspect of temporality, um, but just in a way that you wouldn't see if you weren't looking at it through the photograph. So that's also a case where a kind of another lens is revealing something that maybe is inherent to that proper, to that original, you know. Yeah, I would like to think that in, in a certain sense, he's taking the photographs of the sculptures while they're reflecting, yeah. um, because he's seen them like that he's before. He's seen them like that, <laughs> and, he, and he sees that that, that, that occurs. Yes. You know? I think about uh, documentation in, in this way that it's like um, kind of freeing for sculpture because uh, I, you know, I use these new materials because I want to build my own history into them, my own marks, uh, paint, um, any kind of change to the material. So it's important to me that they begin as something new and purchased. And then I take a picture of it, I document it, and then I'm allowed to manipulate it further. And sometimes it gives me, um, it, it does, it feels like freedom to uh, push a piece past where I would comfortably go with it because it continues to exist because my work often only will exist in the end in a photograph anyway. So it feels like I'm allowed to keep going. And maybe like the fourth time I photograph it, it's this like perfect sculpture in my mind. And then the fifth time I photograph it, I've taken it too far, but that fourth picture always exists for me. The only problem with that then is that there's just this fixed point of view. This one photograph um, will, ex you know, be the favorite point of view in my opinion. And, you know, somebody might disagree with me by wanting to walk around it and enjoying another part of it where um, I've decided that for them, so. I'll, After yeah. Photograph, so then would you, would you remove to go back to photograph number four, or do you leave it at number five? Mm, that's always different. I mean, it depends on the piece. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes like it's like a 3D painting, and then I put all this uh, paint and uh, material on it, and then I decide it's uh, boring, it's not communicating in the way that I need to, so then I'll take it off the wooden stretcher, and then I'll... Um, you know, build a different form and wrap it around, or maybe I like it better turned inside out the way that the paint has um, sort of halfway like bled through the material. It's just, I, I'm allowed to keep moving forward with that once it's captured. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah. Our last opportunity. All right, well, I think, um, I think that brings us to our time. So anyway, thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we hope to see you next week. Yes. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you.